Well, this just in, uh, the United Nations has plans for assembling a peacekeeping force for Syria uh, should a proposed ceasefire be implemented. A top UN official said October 22nd, AFP reported it. The official added that the plans are tentative and will only take effect if the UN Security Council can overcome internal divisions over the uh, situation in Syria. The Syrian regime on October 16 expressed interest in negotiating a ceasefire deal with the uh, country's rebel forces. I also received a, a, an in-depth article on the uh, uh, new nuclear age or the second for a phase of the nuclear age. And this article entitled The Next Nuclear Age by Robert D. Kaplan basically outlines uh, the difference between uh, the first age and the next one. And basically what it's stating is that uh, the mindset of those who uh, hold down the nuclear threat uh, in the old days uh, is the mindset is completely different than those who uh, uh, could be uh, the problem in the new age. And picking it up, it says, for example, during the Cold War, both superpowers were careful not to encourage public rallies during crisis. Uh, doing so could have backed them into a corner to be trapped by their own rhetoric. Indeed, the Cold Warrior style of strategy didn't taunt the uh, uh, enemy or make hysterical calls for its annihilation. Bracken uh, notes. Uh, but the new nuclear age upon us isn't like this at all. It will be closer to the mood of the mob in the street, and that uh, is because rather than ideology, the new nuclear age is driven by religion and nationalism. Nationalism may be passe among Western elites, but it is young and vibrant in Asia. Then there is terrorism, which, when mixed with radical religious uh, fervor and nationalism, can lead to cata uh, cataclysmic war in the uh, new nuclear age. In other words, a terrorist strike of modest proportions ignites a crisis with nationalistic or religious overtones that in turn results in a nuclear standoff or worse. I don't mean a group of terrorists detonating a nuclear bomb. That is a banal worry by Bracken's standards. He is talking about the interaction of terrorism and nuclear states. And the most dangerous states are those with nuclear weapons but weak or at least difficult to deploy conventional forces. Credible conventional uh, capacity means a state does not have to uh, resort to nuclear weapons even in extreme crisis. Add weak armies and air forces to the mix and you have a real instability. Now probably an example of that would be Pakistan who has a, a nuclear arsenal but uh, is somewhat of a weak army. Now Bracken is a Yale professor, Paul Bracken that is, uh, he published a book called Fire in the East, The Rise of Asian Military Power and the Second Nuclear Age. But now this leads to the Israeli-Iranian uh, things. And when it comes to, the, uh, to Iran, Bracken knows of what he speaks since he has uh, not only studied the problem for decades, but has participated in a number of Pentagon war games that factor a nuclear Iran into the scenario. Now this is really what I wanted to bring, in, bring home to you is what uh, this expert has to say regarding what uh, could happen in the, in the near future and how dangerous this situation may be. His take-home assessment is that the idea that an Iran with only a first strike capability would be more vulnerable to attack than the Iran of today is likely wrong. An, a nuclear Iran, even with just a few primitive, albeit deliverable, bombs, would modify both Israel's and America's behavior in the direction Tehran wants. That is what the, the war games indicated. Israel, which knew uh, how to escalate in a conventional setting against a terrorist strike, an antifada, in uh, insurgency, an insurgency, or a Hezbollah missile barrage, suddenly became more cautious when a deployable Iranian nuke was factored into the war games equation. The Israelis worried, what would Iran do? Consequently, they argued among themselves even more strenuously than usual. Another thing the war games revealed, the Iranians are not irrational. 
but their rationality is different than uh, that of the Cold War Americans and Soviets. The Iranians would put nuclear-tipped missiles be, uh, beside schools and hospitals in hardened silos and hidden uh, among masses of conventional missiles, signaling to the world that some bombs were camouflaged, others well protected, and still others quite vulnerable, but only if the Americans and the Israelis were willing to kill many innocent civilians. Bracken describes vividly how a nuclear Iran would stretch relations between Washington and Jerusalem to an even greater breaking point than already exists. Moreover, Bracken uh, points out that whereas the United States and Israel would do almost anything now, short of invasion, to change the government of Iran, once Iran goes nuclear, their calculus could shift. For an Iran in political chaos or in uh, some level of disintegration could put the nukes in the hands of the worst radical elements that are no longer constrained by bureaucratic uh, control mechanisms. Therefore, the Iranian regime knows it will be uh, safer from the intrigues of the Americans and Israelis once it has a bomb. Now on to Turkey uh, and Syria. As you know, uh, many of you know, the uh, Turkey and Syria uh, conflict has kind of escalated. Uh, but it's kind of uh, dying down. And uh, uh, But there are still many challenges that Turkey has to overcome. First, it is attempting to prevent a power vacuum from expanding in Syria. That would uh, fuel Kurdish separatism. Uh, second, it is trying to push back the Iranian sphere of influence while expanding its own into the Arab world. Third, it wants to be taken seriously as a regional leader. Heavily constrained as it is, Anakar uh, appears to have chosen to tackle this array of issues primarily through dialogue. Turkey wants to avoid regime change in Syria and it is not alone. Neither the uh, states uh, trying to retain influence in Syria like Iran and Russia, nor the states trying to force a political transformation uh, in the Levant uh, like Turkey, the United States, Saudi Arabia, France, and Qatar are prepared to weather the consequences of debathification, which would dismantle the state machinery, sideline the Alouette minority, and plunge the country more deeply into civil war. A growing consensus centered on removing the uh, Al-Assad's while largely maintaining the regime has uh, created an opportunity for dialogue between the United States and Turkey on one side and Russia and Iran on the other. Tehran and Moscow have uh, used the months-long stalemate in the Syrian conflict to edge their way into discussions over a post-Al-Assad government. The Russians and Iranians have post, uh, positioned themselves for a possible agreement that facilitates an exit for the uh, Al-Assad's while requiring a prominent space for the Alawites in uh, a new government, something that would preserve Russian and Iranian influence uh, in Syria. The first major dialogue for Turkey to mediate is between the United States and Iran. The United States has no interest in, in initiating a military intervention in Syria, though it is preparing for the possibility that U.S. intelligence uh, assets and special operations forces will have to secure Syrian chemical weapons stockpiles in the event of a regime meltdown, and that very well could be possible. It would be preferable that the Alawites do stay in power, uh, absent of al-Assad uh, family, but uh, that very well may not be the case. The United States also does not want to engage in a military confrontation with Iran over its nuclear program. Washington thus has elected a strategy whereby Turkey does the bulk of the work on Syria while Washington focuses on weakening Iran through sanctions pressure, covert operation and building up a credible military threat in the Persian Gulf. Washington hopes to uh, coerce Iran into negotiations where it can extract hefty concessions from Tehran on issues ranging from Syria to the nuclear or Iranian nuclear program. Timing is everything in such a challenging negotiating environment. The US led economic siege of Iran is starting to bite as evidenced by the rapid depreciation of the Iranian rail uh, in the last few weeks. Iran officials uh, Iranian officials 
claim that Iran can weather hardship um, far better than most think, but the specter of social unrest exploited by foreign powers clearly weighs heavily on Tehran. Iran also cannot shake the threat of a potential U.S.-Israeli strike. Though the chances of such a strike remain low, occasional Israeli saber-rattling, plus a far higher level of U.S. military preparedness uh, in the Persian Gulf, make it much harder for, the, for Iran to call the U.S. bluff. At the same time, Iran is watching the situation in Syria deteriorate and is trying to prevent a scenario in which the sect, uh, sectarian spillover in Syria threatens Iran's hard-fought gains in Iraq. All of this does not necessarily mean Iran is ready to offer serious concessions, but Iran is uh, giving indications that it wants dialogue with Washington. And as you heard yesterday, as I reported, that uh, uh, there was breaking news that Iran and Washington were uh, possibly engaging in secret talks and that Iran was ready to, to negotiate. Of course, both the Iranian officials and U.S. officials uh, immediately denied such talks were taking place, but that the, the negotiations were still going through the, P, uh, the P5 plus one. Frankly, I believe they've always had secret behind-the-scenes talks uh, that just have not come to light. And Turkey is serving as a facilitator for such a, a dialogue between the U.S. and uh, Iran. While the Turkish government has been keeping Washington abreast of these talks, Iran has been softening the atmosphere to create favorable conditions for resumption of talks on its nuclear program. Uh, UN monitors have reported that Iran is converting more than one-third of its 20 percent uh, enriched uranium stockpile into uranium ox uh, oxidide uh, in powdered form to alleviate concerns over potential attempts to produce weapons-grade nuclear fuel. Iran Foreign Minister Ali Akbar Salihai has uh, revealed that Iran is attempting to arrange a, a visit by International Atomic Energy Agent, uh, Agency Chief Yukaya Amano to Iran to discuss the possible military dim uh, dimensions of the Iranian nuclear program, though the United Nations has not yet confirm confirmed the visit. Iran is also preparing a contingency plan for Syria transitioning from a conventional army to an insurgent military force is logical logical for Syria's Alawite minority given the crisis's trajectory. Hints have emerged that uh, Iran is preparing an Alawite militia for use when the uh, al-Assad's fall with the help of Hezbollah. By creating a strong militia, a militant proxy Iran can try to ensure its interests won't be ignored should its latest attempts at negotiations with the U.S. fall through. Turkey must also navigate fitful U.S. Uh, uh, Russian negotiations. Russia has deep relationships with Syrian and Iranian regimes and will likely play a role in securing the exit of the al-Assad clan in return for guarantees of influence in the refashioned government. Russian President Vladimir Putin was supposed to arrive in Istanbul on October the 14th for talks with the Turkish leadership, but that visit was postponed to December 3rd. It appears that Russia may be delaying negotiations over Syria until it gets a better sense of whom it will be negotiating with in Washington. Similarly, Iran is unlikely to make any bold concessions until it, too, can be sure that the next U.S. administration will follow through on its end of any potential bargain. With these broader interests in play, there is not much Turkey can do to influence the time and place of negotiations. Now, of course, there are two other stakeholders in this situation. One is Israel and one is Saudi Arabia. And it says these two key players on the sidelines of negotiations to watch closely. Israel is not a direct participant in the transition talks, but it has a vested interest in preventing the further destabilization of its northern frontier and in sapping uh, Iran's regional strength. Israel will continue to rely on covert means to try to reinforce the pain uh, caused by the U.S.-led economic siege against Iran, 
but will also search for a deal with Russia and that would increase Iranian isolation. So as you can see, Stratford believes that Israel will continue to use covert and uh, non-lethal means, meaning that they don't feel they're going to attack Iran anytime soon, but uh, will continue to probably uh, uh, put a monkey wrench in their uh, nuclear program through uh, viruses and uh, uh, di different kinds of uh, computer-led uh, problems. Meanwhile, Saudi Arabia has been heavily involved in efforts to fortify the Syrian rebellion with the aim of undercutting its regional ad adversary, Iran. Though Saudi Arabia can see the risk to the region of having Syria remain in a prolonged state of civil war, it also does not want to see a broader understanding between Washington and Tehran develop out of the Syrian crisis, an understanding that could strain the U.S.-Saudi relations. Uh, if negotiations gain traction in the coming months, Saudi Arabia may end up being more of a spoiler than a facilitator. So as you can see, these negotiations evidently are about much more than Syria. Syria is merely a conversation starter for much broader strategic disputes. And just so you know, the following information has been taken from a Stratford article. A lot of the information that you've, you've heard today has been from Stratford, which is a major intelligence, uh, military intelligence, foreign policy think tank and magazine, considered to be one of the best in the world. But I have to agree with uh, Stratford. This is nothing more than what I believe will culminate when the Antichrist does come on the scene, in which he will make a plan with many. I know a lot of people believe that this is that, that this very well may be a battle between Israel and Iran, and then Syria and Turkey and and others, and there's, it's a two-way battle or whatever the case may be. But the truth of the matter is, is there are a lot of th there are a lot of irons in the fire that uh, many are trying to posture for better positioning, including the United States in the Middle East. And whether we like to admit it or not, Russia and Iran and Syria uh, all are. Players on one end of the table, while Saudi Arabia, the United States, Israel, and Turkey are players on the other side of the table. Now, the Bible does say at some point in time that Turkey will switch sides and will join in on an attack on Israel that will culminate in the destruction of uh, eight, some 83% of the forces that will come against Israel, known in the, as the Battle of Gog and Magog. But that is still yet future when we don't necessarily know, but I, many believe it's, it's going to be soon. But I think that this is just a, uh, a part of what is going to happen in the near future in which uh, the Antichrist will come on the scene and unravel this puzzle and he will bring peace with many. Right now it seems to be a cluttered mess in which nobody is really making any type of progress. But when the Antichrist, the super leader that will come on the, on the scene, I believe he, the rapture is the next thing on God's prophetic calendar. And I believe once he does rapture his church out of this world that then the uh, man of sin will be revealed and when he's revealed he will bring a peace that nobody thought was possible and it will not only be a peace with Israel but it will be a peace with many and he's going to unravel this puzzle that we are reading about right here uh, in, what, in what Stratford calls a humongous challenge in the Middle East so in closing I, I guess what we're looking at is uh, uh, I, it doesn't look as though there will be any type of uh, war between Turkey and Syria. It's highly unlikely. Uh, the U.S. and Turkey are are very averse to jumping into any type of intervention uh, in Syria. So I don't look for that to be a, the case at all. Uh, as, as Stratford has reported, it is highly unlikely that the United States or Israel is going to attack Iran Israel, both Israel and the United States prefer to continue to place heavy force on Iran to uh, negotiate a settlement rather than force itself. And it looks as though I've read numerous reports, uh, intelligence reports that indicate that even though the U.S. and Iran both have denied uh, talks, it looks as though that uh, Iran is even ever more eager to get to the negotiation table with the United States and uh, to make some type of an agreement uh, and you know I'm sure there's going to be concessions on both sides that are going to have to be met but uh, I fully believe that this uh, agreement is basically around the corner as stated in the Stratford article that Iran will likely wait until after the election to make any type of concrete steps toward uh, a possible agreement 
So we'll have to see what happens after the elections coming up in the next month to see exactly which way this situation goes. But don't expect any attacks from Israel or the United States before that time. And as always, we always like to close with a word of uh, direction and uh, uh, just to let you know that uh, your time is running out. If you don't know the Lord, today's the day to make that decision. Uh, just uh, uh, all you need to do is just say, Lord, come into my heart and save me. Uh, I believe that you died on the cross for me. I repent of my sins. And from this day forward, I plan to live for you for the rest of my days. Now, it's a simple prayer, but you know what? It's a hard action. So I would just encourage you to make that commitment today and accept Jesus as your Savior. This is Terry Malone with the Calvary Prophecy Report.